Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, in honor of a very special occasion, we are turning to one of my very favorite show formats that I like to call Storytime with Paul. That's right, author, speaker, and psychogeographer extraordinaire Paul Weston returns to the show to talk about the one and only Jack Parsons. Paul Weston, all the way from Westonbury, as I now call it. Uh, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure. It's all too good. Splendid. You bring out the best in me. <laughs> well, these uh, these story time with Paul episodes are always very popular, and uh, and we're talking about a very special person on a very special date, aren't we? Yes, we are indeed, because we are talking today. This has been recorded on June the seventeenth, which is the anniversary of the death of Jack Parsons, who is very much. A man of the moment with the uh, extraordinary CBS TV series on his life that has just begun. So there's a lot of interest in him. And I'm hoping to basically talk about a few things and, and give a few perspectives that, that maybe other people won't be giving. You're going to hear an awful lot of stuff about occult details and bits and pieces about Crowley from all over the Internet. In the months to come, I'd like to just um, fling in a few things that are my own distinct take, uh, with that, that that's maybe of interest to some people. Sure, sure. Uh, do you think we should start uh, in the kind of unlikely situation that maybe people are completely unaware of who Jack Parsons was? Should we start there or should we? Oh, okay, well, just a few, a few words then. Uh, Richard Metzger. Uh, I think very nicely characterised Jack Parsons as the James Dean of the occult. So this is uh, a very cool guy uh, living the rock and roll lifestyle a few decades in advance who is definitely uh, a man of science in as much as he's got a crater on the moon named after him. He's a rocket fuel specialist. He's a guy who helped develop the fuel that got got the space shuttle into orbit, but he's also uh, passionately libertarian and dedicated to the magic and philosophy of Alistair Crowley. And this leads him into a free floating, uh, occult legendary magical working called the Babylon working in which he hooks up with a pre Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard and an amazing artistic witch woman called Marjorie Cameron and sparks fly. There's tumultuous stuff. It's considered by some to be a failure, the end result, perhaps the end result is that Parsons, uh, living up to the James Dean uh, idea, it dies a premature death in an explosion and leaves a legend behind and all manner of controversy. Well, that's uh, that's neatly neatly summed up. So um, where, where would we like to take the story first? Okay, well, I've in my... Uh, book Alistair Crowley and the Inner Horus, written a lot about the Babylon work and a lot about Parsons and a lot about L. Ron Hubbard. And there was a, a lecture taken from that book at one of the Glastonbury Occult Conferences a, a few years ago. It's got a lot of that material in it and it's done quite well. But what I feel is worth um, conveying is how did I feel myself so pulled into this? Uh, it's not just a case of an intellectual curiosity about an extraordinary cast of characters. Some definite weirdness went down. It's a typical Paul Weston story that I've not written about or spoken about before. And it starts, it starts with a fat Scotsman, the Daily Star and striptease karaoke, and it leads very rapidly into one of the most powerful magical experiences of the whole of my life. I was working as a civil servant in the VAT HQ in South End in 1994, and my immediate superior was said fat Scotsman, who used to uh, make a habit of reading the Daily Star, which is for those people uh, outside the UK. Uh, the lowest of, of all the tabloids in the UK. Now, he would read this every day, and one particular Friday, I noticed him immersed in its pages and giggling away, and he put the paper down, and he noticed I was looking at him, and he, he invited me to scan this piece 
that he'd been laughing at, which was about a northern pub that had introduced a striptease karaoke night. And he starts flicking through the pages to find this. And I'm immediately um, transfixed because this is the Daily Star. And on page three, there's a picture of a naked Pamela Anderson. Now, this is the time of the peak of Baywatch. And, you know, this is the biggest TV series in the, on the planet. And the Daily Star are putting pictures of Pamela Anderson out as often as possible. And she's wearing a pair of cowboy boots and pretty much nothing else. And she's standing, turning at an angle, holding onto a half-open door. And he goes past this and finds this ridiculous karaoke article, which I'll have a quick look at. But this image of Pamela Anderson has transfixed me. And when I, I leave work that day, I buy the Daily Star in order to get this image. And honest, Gov, I was not thinking in terms of wanking material because something else was going on in me at that time. I had this creative process uh, whereby I, cre- I was often uh, made up these collages in the style I was inspired by Penny Slinger and Nick Douglas uh, and the secret Dakini Oracle and stuff like that. It was long before Photoshop. I just cut stuff out up and put it on, on other things and bring things together and something strange would often happen. And I knew I needed this Pamela Anderson, so cut the picture out, cut off the cowboy boots, and I'd got a big poster of Glastonbury Tour, Summer Solstice Sunrise. It's just basically the shadow form of the tour with a huge golden sun behind the tour tower, and that's what ultimately inspired the, the background of the cover for Avalonia Neon. And I knew I was doing something with this, and I placed this image of Pamela Anderson next to the tour, and it was exactly the right dimensions for one of her hands, which was pointing upwards, to have the middle finger just below uh, the, the sunlit doorway of the tall tower. And the other hand above it was in the top of the sun. So she was like framing the sun behind the tower of Glastonbury Tour. And I thought, OK, that's cool. That's definitely what I want to be doing. And I went into this trance-like state. It lasted about three hours where I was just going through. I used to have carrier bags full of images and pictures and posters, and I was just used to cut them up, stick them together, and do all sorts. Directly above the sunrise, um, I cut out a circular Mandelbrot fractal, and in the middle of it, I cut out a further eight pointed star from Dante Gabriel Rossetti's A Star in Syriaca, which I associated with Ishtar. And, you know, the whole hall of Babylon thing derives from Ishtar, and, and I felt that Pan Randerson was probably the world's supreme icon of that, that archetype at the time. I cut out a bit of the upper part of the High Priestess from Crowley's Tarot, put that above there. Then I had Crowley in his hooded robe, uh, making a gesture of Harpocrates next to that, and had him standing on top of um, John Day's uh, Enochian altar working design. I didn't know what the hell I was doing and crashed out about midnight and left it at that. And the next day, nearly the summer solstice, hadn't expected to be going to Glastonbury, got a sudden chance, car load of people go down there, wild gig in the assembly rooms, crazy psychedelic music woman sort of doing a virtual Salome dance to seven vows with this weird uh, candles, headdress, doing this exotic dance, get back at four o'clock in the morning, get up on a Sunday, and the first thing that's in my head is I've got to read. I've got to have a look at Alistair, uh, Kenneth Grant's Alistair Crowley and Hidden God, which I hadn't read uh, since 1989. And I think the second chapter is called The Scarlet Woman. And Obviously, Grant discusses Babylon in there, and he, he there's a whole bunch of typical Kenneth Grant in nature, which we know is dodgy, but it's like, let's see where we get to with it. He basically says, as Crowley does, that the, the difference in spelling, B-A-B-A-L-O-N, instead of the usual way it's spelled, B-A-B-Y, is so that it adds up to 156 which Kenneth Grant says is magically significant as it conceals many ideas relating to the function of the Scarlet Woman. And he says how the name of the ancient city of Babylon basically meant the Gate of the Sun. And the most important entrance into Babylon was the Ishtar Gate. 
and Babylon can be understood as a channel of solar force through her gate in sexual terms. So I looked at Pamela Anderson holding this mighty orb of the solstice sun behind the tall tower of its doorway ablaze, Babylon the gate of the sun. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. And then he talks about Zion, and he makes this uh, for the use of the Hebrew letter Zadi as being the first letter. He gets this to add to 156, and he, call, he refers to it as the Holy Mountain. And I'd already uh, read a lot of stuff in Jeffrey Ash about how a whole load of the imagery around Glastonbury Tour uh, corresponds to the archetype of the World Mountain. That was second nature to me. So, all right, Zion, the Holy Mountain, that's fine. And he carries on to discuss the city of the pyramids and Enochian magic. Basically, you know, a series of diagrams that are used to communicate with angelic intelligences, chessboard, surface, subdivided to construct four-sided pyramids out of each square, total number of sides of all the pyramids, one, five, six. And there on my collage is Crowley standing on John D's altar top used in those workings. So I start thinking, hello. What's, what's happening here? And then Grant goes into the whole thing about the vision and the voice, Victor Neuberg, the raising of Quran's on, and it's in there that Crowley says that 156 is the number of chaos. And above my gate of the sun, I'd placed a Mandelbrot fractal, which is probably the definitive image of chaos as it is understood in the, mid, in the modern world. And he finishes it off by saying that 156 apply, uh, it applies to Sen Haru, which is a term used by the ancient Egyptians to denote the day of the summer solstice. And that is enough to finally break, break my brain because the backdrop that I'd used for all the other images was, of course, summer solstice, sunrise. And the high priestess, of which I've got the upper part above all of it, takes you in the Kabbalistic attributions of Crowley across the desert to the city of the pyramids on, on the camel of the, the Hebrew letter Gimel. And all of this takes you finally to Benar above the abyss, the final 156 understanding. So the chaos of the city of pyramids is the gate of the sun on the holy mountain. Now this combination of things uh, was basically already, as far as I was concerned, completely impossible. And then I realised that it had all happened. I'd created this on June the 17th, 1994. The actual date of Jack Parsons' death was the date that somehow all of this had configured in my head. So from that point on, I called it the 156 transmission. And I loved the fact, the sheer complete absurdity of it, that this had all been activated in my head, regardless of the fact that obviously I read the book years and years ago, you know, but Cryptomnesia is just ridiculously meaningless almost explanation for that level of, of, of weirdness. I love the fact that there was the absurdity and the total humour of how it had all come to me. And I realised from that point on, you know, there is some kind of connection that I've got with Jack Parsons, the Babylon working and the 156 transmission. And when I moved to Glastonbury you know, years later and I, I went into my sequence of, of 100 public lectures in four years i tried out some of the material that ended up in crowley in the inner hall as i did a lecture called lsd in the atom bomb in january 1996 deliberately set up to be put on during the period of of the 50th anniversary of the babylon working then and, and from that point on you know uh I really got stuck into it and all the material that's in my book that came out at the end of 2009 is all the after effects of all of that. And clearly that gave me a kind of um, emotional predisposition because it was clearly uh, magic and yet I hadn't come to it through putting on robes and doing pentagrams and doing rituals and doing any of the normal accoutrements of what you would take magic to be. And yet this, this, this thing had all of the kind of uh, markers, if you like, of, of the you look for in Crowley Magic and Kenneth Grant. You just got one, five, six splattered all over it. So I love the shit out of that. I, I just had tremendous fun with it. And... It helped me when I read about, you know, Jack's life, 
when I took on board the wider historical context of, of what was going on with him, um, it, it just seemed to give me some kind of uh, feeling tone that otherwise might not have been there and enabled me to uh, appreciate him better. So that's my kind of my leading. And, you know, I'd like to, to go on and, and have, my, have the, a sense of, I've given it in, in the book and I've also given it in, in the video lecture that I really think that period of time, it's, it's a film noir classic, you know, Parsons' mm. life and, and the Babylon working. You can imagine it as a Raymond Chandler novel. You can imagine it as a noir with, you know, a young Robert Mitchum involved in it somewhere. People wearing those kind of suits, the femme fatales. You know, you see photos of Elron Hubbard at that time. It's got that sense about it. And the fact that uh, one of the most credible, um, theories about the nature of his death uh, the fact that back in 1938 he testified in court against uh, a corrupt policeman uh, and uh, got him put in, in prison and that this guy has kind of come out very shortly uh, before Parsons dies. I think you know there is that kind of sense of the film noir the Raymond Chandler detective novel uh, about that whole, uh, a certain flavour of Parsons' life. But what I've also um, got a really, really strong sense of is the context of, of the beat generation as well. I mean, it's very easy. Once Parsons is, is dead and you look at Marjorie Cameron's later life, she's, there's no question she's a beat generation character. There's no question about that at all. But I have a kind of sense of Jack being being somewhere on in the zeitgeist of this. You know, there's there's um a passage in, in Kerouac's on the road. You know, I mean, we're talking mid fifties. You know, four or five years after Jack has died, and Kerouac's saying the only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. The ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, burn, burn like fabulous yellow Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. In the middle, you see the blue centre light pop, and everybody goes ah. Oh. And that to me could really, really easily um, be about Jack Parsons. You know, he fits that bill. And I'm sure many people have seen there's a film in the made in colour in the 60s of Kerouac reading a little bit from, from On the Road. Now, I can quite easily see him uh, or, or have a sense of the beats and, and Parsons. Uh, legendary manifesto of the antichrist you know and imagine kerouac or somebody like kerouac reading an end to the pretense and lying hypocrisy of christianity an end to the servile virtues and superstitious restrictions an end to the slave morality an end to prudery and shame to guilt and sin for these are of the only evil under the sun that is fear an end to all authority that is not based on courage and manhood to the authority of lying priests, conniving judges, blackmailing police, and an end to the servile flattery and cajolery of mobs, the coronations of mediocrities, the ascension of dolts, an end to conscription, compulsion, regimentation, and the tyranny of false laws. So behind all the all the occultism, which which is is the thing that draws people's attention to Jack, you know, people like Robert and Wilson were very uh, clear about the fact that he was a passionate libertarian. And if you read his famous essay, um, Freedom is a Two-Edged Sword, uh, there is that kind of sense that he's not just talking within, you know, the apparently limited uh, scope of, of occultism. He's reaching out and surfing a whole zeitgeist, which is, you know, Crowley's Eon of Horus, we can say. But it's also very intriguing to, to, to put together um, all of those people at that time. and and see how your appreciation of them is deepened um, by, by taking them as a unit. You know, I've, I've always felt that one of the incredible things about the Babylon working is this cast of characters. You know, 
Jack himself, rocket scientist, occultist, poet, bohemian, L. Ron Hubbard, pre-Scientology, Marjorie Cameron. They all come together end of 1945, beginning of 1946. At the end of 44, uh, I'm also, I never cease to be blown away by the fact that William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac all kind of met up in this, this social scene around uh, Columbia University and the whole fateful business of, of Lucy and Carl being uh, the centre of gravity. That was, that was a, an amazing cast of characters that came together. And I had this kind of sense of, of what would have happened you know, what would have happened if Jack had survived? He was, he was down on his luck big time. He's working in, in a gas station for heaven's sake. All his security clearance is gone. He's, he's thinking of selling secrets to the Israelis. You know, he's just making the explosives for, for film companies. I don't know to what extent, if he had lived, he could have pulled himself out of that. But, but I can kind of imagine him and, 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 Marjorie Cameron in the background in a, a smoky room, uh, beating out the rhythm with Kerouac on the table while Alan Ginsberg is reciting how I can really very easily imagine that. And it's also very intriguing to bring William Burroughs into this because um, Burroughs is born in 1914, and that is the same year that Jack Kerouac's born in. And we know that he's a gun freak, but he's also, in his early days, an explosive freak. You know, when he's still in his early teens, he nearly blows off his left hand, messing about, you know, with a whole bunch of chemicals in the laboratory. He even uh, makes a, a bomb that he throws through the window of, of his principal at school and it doesn't explode. Now, can you imagine these days if, if somebody did something like that? Uh, you'd never hear from him again, basically. But Burroughs ends up in Harvard and he goes to this strange kind of trajectory and obviously he endures into the 90s. And I think to myself, well, is, is there a timeline uh, you know, in all the different parallel universes, is there a timeline in which Jack Parsons survives and he goes through the 50s and like Ginsburg and like Burroughs, he kind of forms this bridge into the 60s. How different would it have been? And I think it would be a kind of fascinating science fiction, fantasy, whatever, to imagine an alternative timeline in which he turns up. And in fact, the, the extent to which he w could have made a difference really does, does make me wonder to what extent something hasn't, hasn't tweaked it. You know, I can really see um, Jack and Burroughs and Brian Geissen having all kinds of interesting interactions with each other. You know, Parsons is very experimental. Um, he likes science fiction literature, obviously. He, he convenes a legendary grouping of bohemian and strange characters in, in the past. It's the mansion that he'd managed to rent out where the Babylon working occurred. There's people, you know, a guy that worked as an organist in the silent movie era and fortune tellers and just any, any bunch of freaks and weirdos. I can really imagine him hanging out. Um, with the beats, you know, and I wonder what effect he would have had on the development of witchcraft. We, we've got this mysterious episode where Gerald Gardner spends some time out in California in the, in the late 40s when Jack's about out there during the time when he's getting interested in witchcraft. It's very difficult to pin it all together, but how would he have responded to uh, the whole book rebirth of witchcraft in the 50s you know what would have happened in terms of of uh kenneth anger's work uh if jack as well as marjorie had been around when he's getting inauguration of the pleasure dome together what would have happened in in, in the 60s you know at, to what extent uh could he possibly have connected with the whole apollo program where would he have been at in relation to the moon landing etc etc this is this is fascinating shit to me uh, and i think that if he'd have survived he would have been un indubitably one of the coolest people on the planet and i think a lot of the people in the 60s uh would have looked up to him tremendously and the extent of the width of knowledge and experience that he would have to to have 
drawn from and the passion of his libertarianism then would have been something quite extraordinary. But just to actually contemplate, you know, his life as it actually was and, and, and what played out um, is more than enough to be going on with. And we're getting a lot of publicity, obviously, about his association with Alistair Crowley. This, this is something that is fundamental. But in my book, uh, I like to see all of these things as part of what I'd call the wider Gnostic revival, which is something that's kind of kicking off in the, in the late 19th century and is working its way through the background. And people like Crowley are part of it. And people like Jung with that whole Seven Sermons to the Dead thing and Abraxas, they're all part of it. And, and this is where we bring in, you know, what to me is one of the most fascinating aspects of, of, of the Babylon working and, and its Gnosticism. And this is how, in my opinion, uh, the famous Nagamadi plasmate of Philip K. Dick actually hits California a lot earlier than the 1970s. So I better lead in and say a few things about that for people to, that don't necessarily know the story. Uh, in December 1945, one of the greatest ever discoveries of historical literature was made by a peasant guy at Nagamadi in Egypt. A whole bunch of, of Gnostic Christian writings, generally known as the, the, the Nagamadi scriptures, and they're not fully translated actually until the mid 70s, although Jung uh, ended up with one of the codexes in the 50s. This stuff. There's a, a wonderful story associated with it. The guy that discovered it, uh, he opens the jar, this ancient jar, and all this kind of golden dust kind of floats into the air of this cave. And Philip K. Dick basically felt that this was this, this literally uh, a Gnostic energy that had been there in early Christianity and in the early centuries AD that had been suppressed by the black iron prison of the of the roman empire uh, an orthodox christianity and it came back out of the out of the bottle the holy spirit false the plasmate as he called it and in the 1970s when he had his famous visionary experiences when he he got beams of pink light going in his head and he found himself living in different historical periods simultaneously he felt that all this had hit california now, here's the thing, you know, this has been discovered in December 1945. Uh, it's August 1945 that L. Ron Hubbard has arrived at the Parsonage. Him and Jack are basically hatching out the Babylon working in December 1945, and they begin it in earnest in January 1946. Now, perhaps the most famous passages of all of the Nagamadi scriptures is something called Thunder Perfect Mind, which is attributed to Mary Magdalene and is some kind of sophianic uh, divine feminine exposition. Uh, and yeah, it's a lengthy, a lengthy pace, but I'll, I'll quote just a bit of it. For I am knowledge and ignorance. I am shame and boldness. I am shameless. I am ashamed. I am strength and I am fear. I am war and peace. Give heed to me. I am the one who is disgraced and the great one. Give heed to my poverty and my wealth. But I, I am compassionate and I am cruel. Be on your guard. I am the one whom they call life and you have called death. I am the one whom they call love and you have called lawlessness. And take me to yourselves from places that are ugly and in ruin. I am the union and the dissolution. Now, it's absolutely obvious to me that this is Babylon par excellence, the, the, the current of energy that they're working with uh, exactly expresses this. The genie is out of the bowl. The false has returned. And, and, and it's working its way through these guys uh, at that very point instantaneously, in fact. And if you look at uh, 
Parsons magic, you know, it didn't end with the Babylon working. You know, the Babylon working is just a few months in the early part of 1946. And then after the debacle with L. Ron Hubbard and after um, Jack's life has gone a little bit to pieces in 1948 at the Halloween period, he encounters Babylon again. And she but beckons him to go on what he calls the Black Pilgrimage. And it's during this period of time that he quite clearly states his belief that he had been the Gnostic Simon Magus in a past life. And, yeah, this guy's very, very interesting. He, he figures briefly in the Bible, uh, but there's other uh, Christian apocryphal stuff that, that expands on him. He's almost the first heretic, the first rival to Christ, and in a certain sense, the first Antichrist. And this is the period of time that Jack takes the, the kind of oath of the Antichrist. Uh, and, and this is before the book of Revelation has even been written. And he's around during the time of the Emperor Claudius. He was honoured in Rome as a living deity. He had a statue erected in his, in his honour. And the interesting thing about him uh, from the point of view of Babylon work and so forth, he has a female partner who's a former prostitute that he named Helen. And there's this whole elaborate mythology that explains their interaction, uh, that God's first thought had been female. And she then created angels, demigods, who in turn create the earth. And then they rebelled and imprisoned her in the material world and this led to a whole long series of incarnations, including that of Helen of Pr Troy, during which this divine female was tortured and humiliated until finally she became Helen the prostitute and Simon as God incarnate came to rescue her. Now, this is just classic, classic, classic Gnosticism. And this is very, very early in the proceedings, the time of the Emperor Claudius. You know, it's really not that long after the life of Christ at all. And he teaches, demonstrates paranormal powers. And then there's this famous magical battle with the Apostle Peter in Rome, in which after Simon has levitated into the air, um, he, he dashes, Peter dashes into the ground and horribly injured, he retires and spent false. Now, we don't know, obviously, what the hell really happened in a situation like that, having watched videos of people like um, David Blaine and Dynamo doing their levitation numbers. It's difficult to say. But what was said of Helen and, uh, and Simon Magus was that they engaged in sexual rites involving sperm and menstrual blood. Now, a lot of heretic busters, you know, used to say this kind of stuff, but it's really not necessarily that unlikely. And G.R.S. Mead had, had written about him uh, back in the days of the Theosophical Society in the 19th century, uh, and I reckon that Jack might have been, you know, familiar with all of that. But but there's all of this to take on board, you know, all the way through. Jack is really fundamentally part of the Gnostic revival. Yeah, Crowley's part of the Gnostic revival. The Lima and all the magic is part of it. He's got this enormous, you know, apartment room at the top of the Parsonage Mansion, which, as well as being his flat and his bedroom. Uh, is also the OTO Agape Lodge Temple. And they performed the Gnostic Mass in there, uh, which Crowley had written in, in Russia, I think in 1913, over and over and over again. I seem to recall reading somewhere that they did it pretty much every day. And then having been participated in a number of Gnostic Masses, I find that kind of difficult to believe. But, but there we are. So he's absolutely and utterly, um, completely, thoroughly uh, imbued with this all the way through and i also feel you know that this is, is a very uh strong uh theme that runs through with ron abbott as well but i'll pause for breath there because i've just mightily sounded off yeah but it was uh how do you say we were wrapped uh i love these stories i do do you think so what we're talking about then is there are kind of Shorter and longer cycles. So it, it positioning Crowley and and Parsons and so on in whatever kind of woke up uh, 
you know, late 19th century and through the 20th century, but also a kind of much more macro one where he recognized there's a resonance back to a, a similar uh, cultural pivot point, um, which is, you know, the first century or so uh, of the modern era. Uh, and I find, I find that kind of... Uh, most of what I'm looking for here, not balance, uh, mirroring really fascinating, especially as, so we've got December 46, 45, and then into 46. This is a kind of uh, space-time distortion in the entire 20th century, 1946. A whole bunch of UFO stuff happens, and we lose Crowley and so on. So it's well, interesting. it starts with August 1945, because that, that month, you know, you've got the A bombs, and it's also in August '45 that, that Ron turns up at the parsonage. You know, so there is there is tremendous frisson. on, and obviously Parsons, being a guy that's a rocket scientist and has worked on this jet assisted takeoff thing for American uh, fighter planes uh, during the war, he's 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 very much part of all of that. And I think the the, the sense of it, of the the emotional um, heightened intensity that must have been present there uh there's literally a sense that reality has been ripped to freaking bits you know and that there are no limits yeah and yeah high strangeness really erupts uh and i guess it is worth just saying a little bit about this whole parsons open the window and something flew in with ufology marjorie cameron did say that she saw what we would now call a ufo over the mansion sometime after the babylon working but before the ufo ufological epoch properly engages in the summer of 1947 all there's all of these associations that have been brought forth primarily by kenneth grant uh, about the idea that the babylon working opened up a portal uh, i do actually believe that but it has to be said that, you know, we've got a Jack Parsons' extant writings. He, he lives until 1952. He's a real sci-fi freak. You know, he actually hosted gatherings of science fiction writers at the Parsonage. I'm not aware of him saying a single thing about the Flying Saucer era, you know, from 1947 to 1952, where it's really, you know, in full flow. Uh, I'm not aware of him having a single thing to say about it, which is kind of a, a strange omission in itself. But I do believe that uh, the veil was, yeah, the veil wasn't just thin. The veil was just been blown to pieces at that point. There's no question about that at all in my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's that kind of, it. the visual impression is something like a cosmic finger pushing down on on a malleable surface like a trampoline or a, or a squishy ball, which is space time in that kind of, in that. Well, I like, I like to use the image of the membrane. I think the membrane had been broken at that point. Well, it's, it's amazing when you stack them up and, and, and the formation of different uh, security agencies for whatever, uh, whatever reasons associated with what we're talking about there. It's a, it's a real pivot point in, the i guess longer um, gnostic line you're talking about there's something about that exact point in the timeline that is intense and, and i think it is quite finely engineered um you know the points i was making about what if jack had actually survived and i think he could have been quite a major cultural figure for you know everything that went down in the 50s and especially the 60s and it would be you can't really imagine uh what a figure of that magnitude because yeah it, as i say burroughs was born in the same year and lasted into the mid 90s jack parsons would only have been 53 years old during the summer of love in 1967 yeah, yeah i do I, I do wonder about all of this but having had a pause yeah that that now brings me into uh into the mysteries of, of, of L. Ron Hubbard and um, what the hell he was doing there uh, and what all that's all about. Uh, my, my sense is as time goes by, we get a stronger and stronger appreciation of Jack and he just gets more real to us and people appreciate him, uh, his good points and his bad points. But Ron remains the pantomime villain. You know, people just boo and hiss. Uh, and we don't really get any further with him, but I've I've got again my own stories, my own background that have simply led me 
to perhaps you know look at him uh, a bit differently and at least find the whole situation more interesting than just straightforward uh, pantomimic uh, villainry. And this this started for me after I left university and I started training to become a hypnotist with this um, so-called Institute of Hypnosis and Parapsychology. And when I got all their training material, which included a whole load of tapes and stuff, I thought, hang on a minute. Yeah, I recognise all this. This is just this is just Dynex and Scientology, man. This is just exactly that, only with diff- slightly different terminology. So I approached the guy who ran the whole thing, who's called Peter Goodwin, who um, totally disappeared from sight now. I don't know if he's even still alive. He's very, very little trace on the internet. But Peter Goodwin, and he, he basically said to me that, you know, yeah, you're right. It is all Dynex and Scientology. He had been um, with Ron at St. Hill Manor, East Grinstead, from the mid-50s, more or less from the moment he got there. And he, he, his wife had been Ron's secretary, and they'd been in the whole thing for well over 10 years. And he claimed, uh, and I've heard this from other sources as well, that, uh, and some of the stuff that is in... Uh, the Scientology books of the 50s, that Ron was not the exclusive uh, creator of that material. Goodwin claimed to have created some of this material himself. Then in the 60s, he hived off and became what the Scientologists call a squirrel, and he started selling their stuff uh, for less price than they were selling it for, uh, and they got the ump about it, as they do. And he was declared in famous man a fair game, this was in about 1968, and I think he ended up uh, at a time when uh, the Sea Org was just starting, and they had put some some guy ashore off the coast of Britain who was spying on the Home Secretary. There was all kinds of amazing espionage and shit going on. Good when um, claimed to have testified in court against them. And I did later find in a book called The Mind Benders by Cyril Vosper a, a, a mention of him. And this. So even though he'd been declared fair game, uh, he still considered all the material to be completely sound. And as time went on, I realised the extent to which he just had yeah, just grabbed it lock, stock and barrel. But what that meant was I basically got trained up on a whole load of stuff uh, that was pure Dynex and Scientology. And although Scientology have always made a big deal out of Dynex is not hypnosis. They're, you know, we all know Ron was a was a hypnotist and so on and so forth. But I asked him the obvious question because he'd been in the close proximity of Hubbard for like over 10 years. And at that point, which was 1984, 85, Hubbard was still alive, but he was in seclusion. There was all kind of speculation. I said, well, what was he like? You know, what the hell was he like? And he just said he was incredible. He was absolutely incredible. He was a stunning level of charisma and insight and power, personal power about him. And, and people have just got to take on board the fact that that was the case. And, that, okay, maybe um, he's also got this trickster con man side to him and a lot of the stories he tells you know, you can deconstruct them and say, well, look, if, you know, if this is your real biography, mate, then you must have been like 200 years old to fit all that in. But he had to have got something going for him in order to accomplish what he did. And, and over the years, I've met other people uh, who also uh, were in his vicinity, and they all said that he was absolutely extraordinary. And one of the things that's quite interesting in the last, well, 10 years or so, 10, 15 years is what one of the things they do in Scientology is they find places that are former offices, houses, places where Ron lived, where he had offices, and they they buy them and they completely redo them in all the period detail and they restore them to exactly how it was then and they make a living museum out of it. And all of these places have got Ron's office. You know, they believe that Ron still still runs Scientology and that all of their places have got a Ron's office in. And after I wrote the Crowley book, uh, when it first came out at the end of 2009, I was in London, 
And there's a place uh, in Fitzroy Street, which is, is one of these little places that they have done up. And it was Scientology World Communications HQ um, at one point in the mid-50s. And just down the road from it was another Scientology building where they ran all the processes for the very, very weird have you lived before this life, which is people having past life sessions where they've been on spaceships and intergalactic wars. And it's also uh, where um, Robert de Grimston and Mary met and ultimately went off and became the process church. So fascinating little area of London. And I decided I'd go in and have a look around this Fitzroy Street uh, place so I went in there and, you know, there's a, in the reception, there's a, a photo gallery and there was a picture of Ron in June 1946. So that's just after the Babylon work. And that was fascinating. And they got Ron's office and Ron's chair. And it's the same. T- it's literally the same table that was in that, this office. And this, all this decor from the 1950s. And at that point, there was a typewriter in there. I literally sat down on Ron's chair and put my fingers on the typewriter keys and all the rest of it. And I was conscious the whole time I was in there that I was just getting higher and higher and higher. And um, Scientology, they talk about this theta energy and people becoming operating thetans. And when I went out of there, I went in a pizza hut and I went down into the bathroom and I looked in the mirror. And my pupils were as dilated as if I'd taken acid or amphetamines. You know, there was no question at all. And I, I've been in other Scientology places and got exactly the same effect, that something is going on there and you can just shout your abuse about Scientology and you can give me a million examples of why this is wrong and that is wrong and this is crap and they treated this person badly and this person died or whatever. But the fact is that shit is going on uh, and and I can't ignore that. Uh, And that's what, what fascinates me because... Scientology really is is science fiction Gnosticism. You know, we're we're immortal beings who've been been trapped into this misapprehension that we are limited, uh, but we can in fact regain our, our full you know our full powers. And with all of this kind of perspective, you know, um, some of the stories that Ron tells uh, about his early days, which are consistent, I found very interesting. We, you know, we know he was a, a, a sort of daredevil pilot. That's, that's pretty much true. There are people that would attest to that. And he would tell people before he went to Parsons, you know, in the early days, that he would sometimes see this red-haired woman uh, sometimes winged on the, on, uh, the wings of the plane uh, who he felt was some kind of guardian angel and he called her the empress and he thought that she was was really important and there, at one point he admitted that dianetics had virtually been dictated um by this empress and that he'd not been in a normal state of consciousness when he wrote it and there was a story that he told it was slight variance in a typical wrong manner there's one version of it as it before the war and another just after that he's he's undergone some kind of dental procedure and under anesthetic he's basically virtually died and had an out of the body experience and while he's out there he's seen this enormous great gateway in outer space and it's like something out the arabian nights and he goes through the gateway and in there, he just gets a download of all the knowledge of the universe. It, you know, the whole thing is all there. And, and he zaps back into his body, you know, leaps off the dentist chair or the operating table or whatever it is, uh, you know, gets a gallon of coffee together and just starts writing this thing um, that becomes the legendary text Excalibur which is, is, is so dangerous that if anyone sees it, they go mad and kill themselves and it's locked away in a safe and all this kind of, all this mythology. But, but the basic imagery um, I found intriguing because when Ron got to uh, the parsonage and he started hanging out with Jack and availed himself of all the crony material that would have been around there, um, when I started talking about the Babylon working, you know, you're crossing the abyss, and you're going into the Kabbalistic supernals, you're going into the realm of Benar, and the Tara Trump that goes between uh, Hotmar and Benar uh, is the Empress, 
And the Hebrew letter that's associated with it is Daleth, uh, the ideogram of which is taken to represent a doorway, uh, which is just about um, visible in the Crowley version of the Empress. If you know it's there, it's not obvious. But basically, um, through the other side of that doorway, if you like, the divine supernal light of, of Kepha and the formula and the further formless realms shines. Now, I'm inclined to think that Ron, uh, when he kind of came to this information, uh, it would have rung bells with him from his own experience of the Empress and, go, and this experience of going through the gateway. I, d- I don't necessarily think he's lying when he said he had that experience. So you've got a conundrum of could he, the story that he tells is honest gov, I wasn't really totally involved in all this sex magic malarkey. I was in there uh, working for intelligence to bust them all. Well, maybe, just maybe, he would have been, you know. Uh, but at the same time, he's a very enthusiastic participant, without a doubt. And this, quite possibly, you know, is, is some of the reason behind it. I've gone into this. I'm not going to get go into it all now. You know, I've got a long appendix, about 15 pages long in my Crowley book. And in the, the, uh, the video lecture from the conference on the Babylon working, I talk a lot about this. But basically, to see um, Ron as simply uh, a pantomime villain and a con man limits the whole thing considerably. You know, where everybody says that he had this extraordinary charisma, and him and Jack got on very, very well despite all the sexual tension of Ron's gone off with with Jack's missus and all the rest of it. Uh, and one way or another, you know, the scrying that Harbour does when when he he says. Uh, the Babylon type figure uh, and starts talking about how she's flame of life and she will, you know, she takes a soul and she devours with a flame. It's very eerily prophetic of what happens to Jack, you know, that many years later. And and one way or another, I would access some level of, of, of personal power and consciousness, whatever you can say about his psychological, emotional state, how much he messed people around, what he did was on a massive level of the game. You know, getting Scientology together is no small achievement. And in the 60s, when he's created his own navy, for God's sake, and he's kind of running this espionage game, if you like, he was pretty damn good at that. The average psychotic dribbling idiot can't really pull off that kind of, of stunt and, and survive that kind of pressure. And you get the feeling that it was a skill set that you can't just kind of spontaneously acquire. So. The sense that maybe there's a, a big background in intelligence there. What that's all about, it, it's it's fascinating shit, you know. And I've I've recently uh, met another guy um, who was around in the sixties. I won't say what his name is, but he was a founder member of quite a famous British prog rock group, and he ended up in Scientology. He was was on the first Sea Org vessel uh, in 1968, the Apollo, and he. You know, came into quite close contact with Ron and hung out with his family and his kids during that period of time. He left the moment he got back to Britain, it has to be said. But but he, you know, has still got his e-meter nearly 50 years later. He's still got a box full of Scientology stuff. He was an auditor. He reckons he could run a session, you know, pretty much tomorrow. It's still all part of his mental furniture without him even thinking about it. And he will acknowledge the fact that, you know, Ron was quite a dude. So there's an amazing mystery there. Um, as far as the TV series is concerned, you know, we know our litigation Scientology. Oh, I can't see how the hell they're going to do justice to Ron. Uh, I just hope they do justice to, to Marjorie Cameron, uh, who was an extraordinary, you know, creative force uh, in her own right and was, yeah, a, a classic beat generation character and a classic... S- natural witch you know she didn't have to hang about with any any lineages or get initiated by anybody she just was the authentic deal right the word go and that's absolutely obvious from just looking at her for five seconds in in inauguration of the pleasure dome but that cast of characters that's what really sets it apart that's what makes the babylon working uh to me so potent and so legendary that alchemy of those characters uh, we've never seen anything like it even in anything that Crowley did I don't think we've ever seen anything like it yeah it it certainly stands to reason that Ron as well as being presumably charismatic as you mentioned 
probably had some kind of capacities. So whether he brought them, because, you know, if Jack and, and the group are doing magic and, uh, and, and Ron becomes quite prominent with them, like he's probably in some way good at it, you know, <laughs> before they go off to do the Babylon working. How would he have been selected as the scryer? So it's one of those questions of when that began and and was it just a capacity he was born with i agree i think there's probably something to those daredevil visions then uh and isn't it funny um 20th century gnostics and dentists <laughs> well yeah you know i mean i think that's 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 all somewhere in the background of, of of philip k dick's thing as well so you know the wisdom of the wisdom tooth perhaps all right so with the show on uh, at the moment. I haven't seen it yet, obviously. Um, I haven't either, no. Is there stuff, because this has been, this is quite a good companion piece for people to watch it. I agree, I don't think they're going to get, although arguably is it would be impossible to ever do, I agree they're not going to get a, a sufficient amount of nuance for Ron. Uh, what else should we tell people about that they're probably not going to get not right, but will lack that depth. Like, should we talk? Have we even spoken about the Babylon working itself? We kind of talked around it. Well, yeah. Um, I guess the intention. I mean, from what I've I've heard about the first episode, I mean, it's, it's intriguing to me. I am very much looking forward to seeing it one way or another. Uh, Thelemites seem to be fairly happy about it, even though it seems that of the central cast of characters uh jack's the only person under his own name there's fictional characters there's a fictional device of some guy uh engaged in dubious magic in which perhaps a goat is going to get hacked up that, that that doesn't sort of sound particularly uh useful to me but basically okay the, the babylon work in itself um I've mentioned the context of the apocalyptic summer of the A-bombs, the end of the Second World War. Jack had engaged in a consideration of Crowley's idea of the Aeon of Horus, this period of time that began in 1904 in which the old world uh, of Christianity and, and previous epoch of civilization had been essentially destroyed by fire on the inner planes and the old forms were breaking down. And to what extent that was going to play, play out in, in the external world remained to be seen. But the First World War had happened, the Nazi era had happened, the horrors of the Second World War had happened. A period characterised by a ferocious warfare um, which seems to be prophesied in the third chapter of the Book of the Law, which is the words of the Egyptian god Ra Horkirin, so a kind of form of Horus. All of this was pretty extreme, and Parsons felt that this incredible energy that had been unleashed, that was breaking down old forms, needed some kind of mitigation, and it needed the divine feminine. And there is, in Crowley's writings, you know, the first chapter of the Book of the Law are the words of the sky goddess knew it. And, you know, they're pretty loved up and groovy. They could be seen as a kind of prophecy of the summer of love, whereas the chapter three is more a, a, a prophecy of, of the horrors of global war. In that first chapter, there's, there's this hint that there's a secret name uh, to knew it. That, that Crowley's going to get, and this is is revealed a few years later in in the legendary uh, Enochian workings in the Algerian desert with Victor Neuberg, that are written up as the Vision and the Voice, one of the most extraordinary magical spiritual documents of the 20th century. Without a doubt, this is where Babylon is first seen and experienced by Crowley, and, and there is this sense that she is. Um, an incredibly potent uh, expression of the divine feminine who's perhaps we barely got anything uh, in, our, in our mental filing cabinet that could do justice to her. Maybe some of the uh, Egyptian and Greek goddesses and, and the ancient forms that she springs from, like Ishtar uh, in, the, in the Middle East, but in people's contemporary consciousness, some of the Hindu goddesses like Durga and particularly Kali, uh, are perhaps more appropriate to her. Uh, 
she's full of love but it's a, a, a love that is not in any way sentimentalized it can be uh ruthless in terms of of the fact that in order to reach uh the understanding of her gnosis uh all the old ideals the forms of the ego etc have, have got to be dissolved offered up as blood into the cup of her chalice and you know there's jack a guy who's, who's, who's reciting Crowley's Im to Pan when he's setting off experimental rockets that are virtually getting into the stratosphere. He has this feeling, very Dionysian, you know, the, the kind of, of guy that is, is very much a rock and roll party person that it's for him to sort of take on board. You know, it sounds like a very grandiose, egomaniacal enterprise to say that you're going you're gonna to somehow do this. But you've got to think, you know, he's a guy who's who's hanging out uh, with people that are broadly involved in the Manhattan Project. You know, he's, he's making rocket fuel for stuff that ultimately becomes the space program. And, and it, it's it's an ex- incredible period of time. He's doing peyote, he's doing mescaline. I can, I can understand that, you know, a guy with that capacity uh, is is going to run the risk of inflation but the Babylon working is concocted by him and L. Ron Hubbard and it broadly uses um, as a kind of foundation the uh, Enochian magic that you've discussed on the show before of John D. and Edward Kelly and there's basically uh, an awful lot of wank, magical wanking involved which is not everybody's um, bag necessarily there are you know uh, Things consecrated, the magical uh, squares of these Enochian pyramids and so on and so forth. And they're trying to, and this is where it gets a little bit um, difficult to pin down, basically they want a, uh, to bring some woman into their orbit who will uh, have particular qualities that will enable her to incarnate Babylon. Now, whether that means uh, that she will become pregnant with Babylon or whether she is Babylon herself, again, this is all a bit indeterminate. Marjorie Cameron, slightly different versions of the story, but after they've already started the whole thing, she pretty much turns up on the doorstep of the parsonage and is quite happy to get stuck right in without scarcely knowing anything about what's really going on. And later on, um, you know, there's kind of a certain amount of contention as to whether she herself was Babylon. You know, no child was ever conceived in these workings. She later had a sense that possibly the hippies who manifested in 1967 were the children of, uh, were her children, were the children of the Babylon working. But one way or another, Crowley is being informed about a certain amount of this. He's still alive at this point. Letters are being sent to him. He pretty much gives up on them. Uh, in, in, in the Lemic magic in general, in the studies of Crowley, uh, it's considered that this thing you know, did not work out as it was supposed to, that it was not um, created on firm foundations. Parsons went off into the desert, and there are three chapters in the Book of the Law you know, famously, supposedly dictated audibly by an external intelligence. Parsons believes that he's got the fourth chapter to the Book of Babylon. Now, uh, the Book of Babylon is, is, I really like it. I think it's awesome. I think it's incredible poetry. It's passionate. It's full of real magic, but it is not on the same level of the game as the Book of the Law as far as I'm concerned. So I understand you know, the Thelemic purists who consider him to be, as Kenneth Grant characterised him in uh, the Magical Revival, as a strayed god, you know, a failure. The end result is, yeah, you know, he he dies in an explosion. Uh, To what extent, you know, that is his true will and his destiny, or to what extent something has, has tweaked the timeline and said, no, you're not going any further, we don't know, but there is, you know, he's left the legend behind him because now, more than Crowley even, you know, if, if, if people in Thelema uh, are interested in Babylon, if women in Thelema are, are entering into considerations of, of what it is to embody that energy and to, you know, to what extent in any way um, any men should define that for them and to what extent they, they work that out for themselves, 
all of this stuff is you know crowley is the source of it but jack parsons and marjorie cameron are the amplifiers of it so it, it's tremendously important in in terms of of what the divine feminine is all about you know uh because babylon kicks ass babylon doesn't take any prisoners babylon is not you know as as gerald's sister once lampooned current concepts of wicca you know the goddess of 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 babylon is not some little girl in a in a Laura ashley dress skipping through the daisies she's girl of a sword she's full of fire and at this point in history where the world is being you know nature is being abused where we're there's so much horrific oppression and so forth the warrior a warrior goddess of antiquity guilt girt with a flaming sword coming back to take out the trash and to kick ass and to reform if need be with 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 force and fire um the false sexual morality and all kinds of flipping nonsense that's embedded in the patriarchy that's that's present you know in in a lot of of male conceptions of magic then then so might it be um kenneth grant you know in, in alistair crowley and Eden god he's got a lot of stuff in there about babylon and scarlet woman he's got a lot of stuff about carly in there as well my own feelings my own experience of all of this it is i've always tended to to get a sense of of carly in in all of this and uh, whatever you know sexual gnosis is going on in that it's not it's not conventional you know, uh, when people talk about the Whore of Babylon, you know, there, there, there's a lot, I'm not going to go too much into this, but there are, there's tremendous contention um, in certain quarters uh, in and outside of the OTO at the moment about certain issues pertinent to this, you know, the, the, when men are engaging, male thelemites perhaps engaging with, with the energy of the Whore of Babylon, they're using, you know, they're, they're using the, the Christianized messed up form of this in terms of their own expectations and, and how they engage with it and in fact you know it's something else altogether yeah and what's interesting to me is 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 that um at the same sort of time that jack's getting all this babylon stuff together uh in the catholic church there's this immense uh petition to get it acknowledged that the Virgin Mary did actually ascend bodily to heaven. And this was made official Catholic doctrine only in 1950, although, you know, it had effectively been believed for an awfully long time. And Jung talked a lot about this, that it was very important. Now, I felt that, you know, and I've mentioned this in my Crowley book, that the two female protagonists, if you like, in the whole Book of Revelation scenario, you know, the woman clothed with the sun, blah, 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 and the Hall of Babylon had taken up their positions again. And in fact, it's time for them to just, you know, they, they come from a primal unity. You know, if you look at uh, Babylonian goddesses like Ishtar, those, that, that culture had no problem at all in seeing a goddess of, of love and war, you know, fertility and death. You know, that life is a unity, life is a full spectrum. And if you start compartmentalizing it and putting one bit against another and repressing one for the sake of the other, then you're going to get all the kind of flipping turbulence and dysfunction that we've had through, you know, there in the background of Christianity in, in this epoch, you know, they have to come together again. And, and part of that process, I believe, was, was what was happening through the Babylon working and, and the current that that unleashed yeah it's interesting you mentioned jung because i have a similar impression of him that i do of parsons which is jung managed to kind of transform psychology with one hand tied behind his back in the 20th century and we only of course got the red book in the 21st and if we i think yeah. if you look back at that from the end of the 21st century if we look back in across the century that you and i weren't you know, see, and back into the 20th, I think Jack and Marjorie, and to some extent, L. Ron Hubbard will have more staying power and impact. It's almost like Jack's century is now. You see the We Are the Witchcraft stuff uh, all over the internet, and you do have to look pretty hard in the 120-year um, history of this supposedly pro-female sex cult to uh, to find many women in it other <laughs> at the level that Marjorie was. So I do kind of think that um, 
there's something about some people that are like 50 years before their time, or as you, I feel what you mean about, it feels like they, it was put on pause or scrambled the things that Jack and co could have done if he hadn't blown up and, and so on. But it feels like the pause button is maybe having been taken off and he's kind of there. Yeah, there's no question when you, when you say um, the words do what thou will projected on, you know, the HQ of, of CBS yeah. uh, as part, promo uh, for the tv series last last week we know something big is stirring and yeah there'll be a a, i'm already starting to get some pretty strange people subscribing to me on youtube and and more and more comments cropping up by people that are not very happy bunnies there's no no doubt that um there will be a kind of frenzy against all of this but in the midst of all that frenzy, a far higher percentage of people will now get interested and, and find their own way, you know, to the gnosis, to the download, to the mystery uh, than, than would have done before. And, and, and this is the great thing, you know, my, my own experience of connection food is absolutely flipping ridiculous, you know, um, Striptease karaoke fat Scots and material was absolutely com- nothing to do with any occult order, any conventional occultism. What I was saturated in it, and I was I'd become a vehicle for it, the form in which it came through to me. And, and this is red letter Parsons' own taste. You know, Crowley were, uh, Crowley's literary taste were formed in the 19th century, and he looked down his nose at the kind of books that Parsons was reading. Uh, and you know, one of the the great inspirations for him was 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 the darker than you think, the sort of lycanthropic um, novel. You know, I, I, I all these pulp forms. You know, if I I am quite happy that somehow or another a TV series uh, can be the vehicle of, of the gnosis. You know, it, it's a corrupt form, but this is the goddamn Kali Yuga, and. I, I, I'm always uh, in awe of the ability of American teams of scriptwriters to hold multiple plot lines and, and weave all these kind of character arcs through, through se- great series, even if they don't do justice to it. And I don't see they can. I don't think it's it's possible that they can remotely do justice to the, to the immensity of this and the incredible intricacy of, of all of these characters They're, they've still got a chance there uh, and i'm very very intrigued you know very very intrigued indeed to see how it all plays out well we will definitely uh get you back on when when that happens but I, i'm in broad agreement there where i'm not especially bothered i guess if you can see a long enough timeline i'm not especially bothered with how people find that personal transformation if it's from a tv show so be it if there if it, if there's enough in that for people watching to go ah oh, i might be into this and 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 go on their journey then you know as you say yours involved the daily star so it, it, cbs oh, well, is a slight step up <laughs> You know, the TV of the 60s and 70s uh, and uh, so many of the cult movies, what they've done for us, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's in many respects they've, they've served the Gnosis as much as any, any occult order. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, that's why um, I go with creativity. You know, creativity and inspiration are, are really... Um, the vehicles for magic, yeah, you've got to have the foundations, you've got to have the ABCs, you've got to have a certain amount of knowledge and be a prepared vehicle. But once you're up and running, uh, your measure of, of is this a go up, is the extent to which um, the creativity and the inspiration is there. And, and that's what I think is is clearly present in the original Babylon working so greatly. Mm. Well, that's a really good message to end on, as a matter of fact, Paul. So uh, for people listening, uh, obviously, there'll be a bunch of stuff in the show notes that matches our discussion. But anything else you got going on or where can people find you, that sort of thing? Well, yeah, I mean, um, maybe um, a little bit further on down the line, we can have a full on chat about this. I know I've mentioned it to you before. Uh, We've got a free float in William Blake Festival. Um, in Glastonbury at the beginning of August and as part of that I've ended up going into a brainstorm where I'm attempting to get another book out 
about William Blake, and I've gone into, I've found myself going into all kinds of strange territory with um, late 18th century scene in London, and then again in the 60s, and a whole bunch of stuff with Ginsburg and Co. and how that all hangs together. And it's kind of like my version of Grail Marcus's lipstick traces, you know, mm-hmm. of, of to get the Sex Pistols in there. It's all a bit, it, 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 it's a it's a blast, and you know, to sort of wet people's appetite. I'll, I'll, I I feature um, in the book. Uh, I won't say too much about because it, it is just to to make people think what Alan Ginsberg's uh, legendary William Blake wank wanks that changed history. Uh, the wank that set Allen Ginsberg off on his entire poetical career in which William Blake spectacularly intruded. I'll say no, I'll say no more than that. You know, some people, <laughs> but other people, if they want to hear more, we'll talk about it on a, few, on a future occasion. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, fantastic chat. It's really fun to have been able to do this on the anniversary of the explosion. It is. You know, I'd like to think there'll be some potent weirdness floating floating through the airwaves when this comes out for everyone to listen to. Yeah, absolutely. All right, sir. So, uh, I love these chats, and uh, better let you go. All right, happy days, Golden. Yeah. There we go. Bombs, Babylon, Beat Poets, Breasts in Newspapers, Biontology? It's probably it for the letter B. If you're keen to know more about the Babylon working, you'll find the video Paul referenced in the show notes for this episode. And keep your eye out for the series we discussed, as Paul mentioned, as well as keeping your eye out. Keep your mind open to the possibility that it might be good. These stories are wide enough for the quote-unquote inspired by true events to potentially result in an actually good show. I appreciate that there can, you know, sometimes be a panicked cleaving to accuracy or a reaction to the lack of it in depictions of precious events and people. But in a funny sort of way, it's very Jack to spill out into fictionalized versions, given what he believed he was doing and may well have done to the democratization of that witchcraft, Babylon, etc. current. So uh, that's it from me. Be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. Find us at runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page. And find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.